Hello, I'm Mariah Thomason, the Barraquette Associate Professor of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at NYU Langone. Hi, and my name is Claudia Espinosa, and I'm the Project Manager at the lab. And we're going to be presenting together today, and we're going to share some research examining the early effects of poverty in the very early human brain, specifically beginning in human fetal life. The central goal of our research is to discover fundamental properties of the early human brain, particularly with regards to large scale network development. And it's not only the fundamental biology that we're interested in and the neuroscience of brain development, but also the operations of the environment that act on that emergent structure and critically the relevance a variation in those networks to future human health. Programming of the human life course begins extremely early, even beginning in the womb. And this is the period that we're interested in examining, and the way that we look at it is using functional MRI. Um, to do this, we invite pregnant women to come in beginning in the second and third trimesters, and we begin to um, study the emergence of neural network connectivity. Now, it probably doesn't come as a surprise to anybody that this is challenging work. Um, the predominant problem being motion, despite our best attempts, we're not able to ask the fetus to please remain still. Um, but we now know from studying the fetus for many years that the fetus does alternate between periods of quiescence and periods of high motion. And so the data that we'll share with you today comes from taking those segments where the fetus is relatively still and concatenating them into a single time series. Um, but that's not the only problem. The fetus comes with no single imaging orientation for analysis. We lack atlases and automatic segmentation and registration processes, which makes um, the steps uh, for analyzing the data rather labor intensive. Another issue is that the fetal brain is small, so the effective resolution of the images that we're taking is quite different than studying um, adult humans, for example. And if that wasn't enough, the fetus is encased within an independently moving maternal compartment, which is also contributing noise um, to the images themselves. And then finally, one of the topics that's um, sort of near and dear to my heart is that we possess limited understanding and knowledge about the physiological basis of bold MRI. Now, I'm not gonna get too much further into the aspects of the methodology itself today, but we've published now a number of papers that have um, sort of transparently shown the processing pipelines that we are using in the lab. Um, and you can see represented here raw fetal um, fMRI data taken at different stages, um, some of the denoising techniques that we use, manual segmentation of the brain from the surrounding tissue, and also the concatenation of these um, rather um, lower movement time series. Today what Claudia and I are going to talk to you about has to do both with what are some of the nuggets or the little things that we've been able to discover about normal um, development of large scale networks in the human fetal brain. Um, and I'm just going to run through some of those quickly and then I'm going to turn to Claudia who's going to talk about a recent study that we've completed examining whether we would observe differences as a function of SES in terms of how these networks look. Um, so to start us off, um, some of the things that we've discovered are that the networks themselves move from relatively low efficiency to high efficiency. And what we see there is we see sort of a lot of local connectivity that gives rise to more integrated networks. Um, so submodules of the brain being more connected to each other and along with this, um, we see increased efficiency. And this fits with what we understand from um, post-mortem studies of the fetal brain using diffusion tensor, complementary techniques, histology, where we see physical outgrowth where local connectivity gives rise and extends to increasingly distant brain targets. Um, so what this outgrowth um, shows us sort of at the network or graph level is that we see uh, that modularity decreases. So what you're seeing again is more connectivity in these local regions, for example, here in green, you see is able to give rise to more distant connectivity and there's also more crosstalk between these networks. And this is in contrast to what we know to be true in adolescents and adults in the transition from childhood to adolescence, where we actually see a increase of modularity, which has been thought of as sort of a specialization of subnetworks of the brain as they become more specialized to the processes that they support. Um, so this is potentially an inverted U shape where initially there's connections between those subnetworks um, and then later in life, that will, that, will, that will be a separation. 
We've also observed um, hubs of connectivity, um, which are familiar to many of you in um, slightly different regions than we see in adults. In this study, we found many in the cerebellar networks. Um, we also see increase in the rich club coefficient where regions that are highly connected are regions that are preferentially more connected to one another. So this was interesting work um, because what I'm describing here, or it was surprising or interesting to us, is that there are topographic properties of the brain that suggest the existence of a dense and sophisticated interconnected network structure already present before birth in the human field brain. And so learning um, all of these factors about organized structures, I got curious. And with colleagues in the Netherlands, we decided to try to quantify how much overlap exists in fetal and adult overall network organization. So here what I'm showing you in adults are the top 10% strongest connections across the entire brain, shown here as blue dots, and sorted by the neighborhoods that they reside in. A sort of fingerprint of who is talking to who. Well, were we to perform the same analysis in the fetus or a group of fetuses in this case, how much overlap do you expect we would observe? Where 100% is completely identical fingerprint and zero is none. We found 62% at this insignificant overlap between the fetal and the adult connectome. So armed with the knowledge that the fetus possesses such an elaborate neural architecture led us to want to examine the topic I raised at the beginning of the presentation, which was does the prenatal environment help to shape these neurocircuitry and how? And so with this, I'm gonna transition over to Claudia, who's gonna tell you about our recent work examining the effects of being low resource or poverty on this developing network structure. I can't share because it does host disabled screen sharing. Ah! <laughs> All right. Let me fix that. All right, there you go. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mariah. Um, so previous studies have explored this interaction between SES and the human brain. And what we have learned from them are that children that come from these low social economic status backgrounds perform more poorly um, than their peers that come from high slash middle SES backgrounds, specifically on tasks that probe things such as selective attention, inhibition, cognitive control, and working memory. Additionally, they have seen that Poverty is tied to structural differences in the, in the brain in several areas that are closely associated with school readiness skills. And in some studies, um, studying this interaction in earlier stages of life, we actually see that, that there are disparities in brain activity um, that can potentially be pointing to early risk for things such as language and attention difficulties. So with this and the extensive research that has been done, we actually see that SES does have an impact on things such as structural and functional brain development. And there is also influence on cognitive systems such as language, executive function, memory, et cetera. But with this, we ask, what is missing in the studies? Where are the gaps? And what questions do we need to ask in order to address these things? And two things that we want to particularly address here are how early can these SES effects on the brain be demonstrated? And second, how these changes might, how these changes in the forming neural circuitry might relate to these developmental differences that we observe in these children who come from low SES environments. So just to recall, we need to recall that social economic status entails is a measure, is a more complex measure that is uh, composed of a combination of things such as educational attainment, income, and occupation. And for this particular study, we decided to look at maternal education as our measure of SES. And the reason for this was that um, the majority of our moms from our longitudinal cohort actually identify primarily as minorities, approximately 60% um, come from below, they fall in below the poverty threshold line and approximately 63% identify as single moms as well. So when we look at things such as income or income to need ratio, we don't get such a nice normal distribution as we do when we see uh, maternal education, which allows us to dichotomize the groups really well, giving us a total N of 135 participants, 72 of whom have high school or less educational attainment, and 63 who have more than high school educational attainment. 
And to start off, we just wanted to make sure that our groups had no statistical significance in things such as GA at birth, GA at scan, maternal uh, age, et cetera, and also other variables that are important for imaging analyses, such as frame count, motion, et cetera. And you can see that um, none of the groups are statistically significant. So the approach we decided to take was a seed-based connectivity analysis, and the bilateral amygdala was manually defined on this 32-week fetal anatomical template that you see here. And what I first want to share with you is what we observed in a full fetal sample of amygdala connectivity when only controlling for GA at scan. And interestingly, what we saw were a similar um, activation patterns that studies looking at older populations, also again exploring amygdala seed-based connectivity to entire brain, um, the results that we see in the fetus are actually pretty well reflected. Um, here, areas in the orange show positive connectivity and areas in the blue show anti-correlated um, connectivity. And as you can see, the same is uh, observed in older populations. And as I had mentioned before, there are some infancy studies that look at this and they as well reflect what we see in the fetus. But again, like Mariah was saying, what we are really interested in is trying to see whether or not there are um, group differences as a function of SES status. So now I will share with you um, our group differences from amygdala connectivity. And here in orange, you see that the low SES group shows relatively more connectivity in these inferior areas, as well as prefrontal cortex areas. And the high SES group shows more connectivity in these lateral temporal areas and these lateral frontal areas. But with these results, the next question that we want to ask is how do we interpret these effects? Um, what else can we know and how do we interpret these things? Um, so now I will pass it back to Mariah so she can explain to you the approaches we took in order to further investigate. So as, as Claudia pointed out, we did observe differences in connectivity, varied patterns that were associated with SES as reflective of maternal education. Um, however, there are a couple of challenges. The problem is that we need to, there's a couple of problems that we need to overcome in order to meaningfully interpret these effects. Um, and these are really difficult to address. And the first is that we don't have strong representation of what good or bad is in fetal amygdala connectivity. We don't have a reference. We don't have a large literature um, to compare these results to. We don't have associations with what um, amygdala connectivity in utero, um, how that relates to future development. Um, further, uh, there are additional life factors that we certainly expect would also contribute to fetal functional brain development um, that may differ um, as a function of SES. And how are these contributing to what we're seeing in the brain? These are challenging things to address. Um, so we had sort of a, a novel idea that I'll share with you now. We do have a larger sample of children that have been followed as part of a longitudinal study. So we didn't give you full background on the project, but this is a Detroit-based sample that have been followed since the prenatal period, and the oldest of the children are now reaching age six. And so not all of them had um, data from the fetal period that met perfect quality standards, and therefore not all of them could be in a full analysis. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to try to look at developmental outcomes associated with amygdala connectivity so that we could begin to say in this larger sample that we had available, we could begin to say which patterns of connectivity were associated with better future outcomes and which patterns of amygdala connectivity were associated with worse outcomes. So in the largest possible available data set, so that's children that are old enough to have aged into the follow-up um, window at age three and had perfectly good imaging data and reference outcome data available, which in this case was 102 and 103 with overlap to the data that we just showed you, but we, to obtain the best power, we wanted to include the whole group. We looked at which areas of the brain were associated with higher CBCL scores and with a higher Bitsy problem score. So these are, these are not desirable outcomes. And these are the areas we saw. So for CBCL, these are areas we saw higher connectivity to the amygdala, um, and in blue, higher connectivity with higher Bitsy scores. So those are areas we would call then bad areas. 
And then here we see areas that are associated with better outcomes. So higher connectivity of the amygdala to these regions, again, for the same outcomes in these large samples, um, we see these regions that we can now say are associated with better outcomes. So what we then did is we masked, we created masks that were associated with better or worse outcomes. And then we went back to the analysis that Claudia showed you and we sorted all of our outcomes based on whether they found in these uh, were found in these regions that were associated with better or worse outcomes. And for those that were in the higher SES group, looking at falling within the better outcome regions, we found no regions that surpassed uh, rigorous uh, multiple comparisons correction. We looked within our lower resource group and found, sorry, and then we looked for regions that came within our higher SES group that were falling within regions that were associated with less good outcomes and again found none. So for our higher, higher um, SES groups, we found that none of the patterns of activity were associated with better or worse future outcomes. So we could not classify them as such. The same was true within our low resource group for areas that were associated with good outcomes, but something interesting happened within areas that were associated with less good outcomes within our low SES group. We found three significant effects in three different regions of the brain that fell within regions that we know were associated with less good outcomes. And in fact, when we um, stop performing this rigorous multiple comparison correction and we just do voxel counts, so how many voxels in a between group comparison fall within areas that we know are associated with either good or less good outcomes in the future, we see significantly more voxels within our higher SES group falling within good regions and more voxels within bad regions within our low resource groups. So overall, we do observe a significant association between maternal SES and connectivity in fetal socio-emotional brain circuitry. Uh, these data also demonstrate that the patterns of connectivity observed in fetuses of lower SES mothers corresponds with less optimal socio-emotional socio development in toddler years. What I didn't show you just for the sake of time is that we also did look at that second challenge, which is whether there were other factors in these women's life that explained some of the variants observed in the significant regions that fell within these future outcome regions. And we did find two factors out of three that we looked at did have additional explanatory power, and those were maternal sleep and also maternal self-reported worry with regards to financial matters. So those are things that we'll be following up um, as we continue to write up the work. Um, and that's what I'm mentioning here. And so those are the data that we're currently looking at to begin to understand further that it's probably not just poverty that has an effect on fetal brain development, but other things that may potentially be mediators or moderators. And these are extremely important to pursue because these are also potential therapeutic or intervention targets for future work. And then finally, I want to close by thanking especially those that are involved in the work. Um, particularly, Martha Farah has been um, deeply involved in these analyses and thinking about how to interpret these effects. Also, the many students and research scientists that have contributed to our Detroit sample and Detroit data collection, and also our very extremely wonderful, valuable families um, that have contributed their time to their work. And thank you all for your attention. Um, I'll stop the share so that we can say goodbye. Um, Martha, thank you for organizing the symposium. Um, this is my first official COVID virtual symposium. I wasn't able to do the background, but I'm really glad to be part of this session and presenting with the other speakers. This is working at home with your dog. Um, and Claudia, thank you also. You're muted, but if you wanna say goodbye. Yeah, um, I just want to say thank you. This is actually my first presentation, so it was great, and um, I can't wait to see the further work that we're going to do. Thank you.